It's really a great, uh, great pleasure to be hosting uh, a retired Admiral James Stavridis, uh, whose accomplished life in, in various fields uh, could best be summed up, uh, as it was by John Meacham, as sailor, scholar, and strategist, uh, or as the New York Times once dubbed him, a Renaissance Admiral. Um, as a sailor, Jim had a truly distinguished career uh, spanning uh, three and a half decades. He was a surface warfare officer who commanded a destroyer, a destroyer squadron, and an aircraft carrier battle group. Uh, ashore, he spent stints as executive assistant to the Secretary of the Navy and senior military assistant to the Secretary of Defense, who at that time was Donald Rumsfeld. Uh, he became the first Navy officer to head the U.S. Southern Command, uh, which uh, oversees uh, uh, military operations in Latin America, and later shifted to Europe, where he spent four years as the Supreme Allied Commander at NATO. Uh, in the ranks, Jim developed a reputation as a strategic thinker and innovator, someone able to, to think at times outside the box. Uh, so it really was uh, no surprise that after retiring from the military service in, um, in 2013, uh, he went into academia and became the dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. <laughs> guess, guess, guess some of you have heard of it. Um, where where he, uh, Jim earned a PhD there in international relations uh, back in the 1980s. Uh, he left Tufts last year and uh, to embark on yet a third uh, career in, in private equity. He's, uh, he's an advisor to the Carlisle Group and also to the international consulting firm McClarty Associates. And in his spare time, serves as, a, as an uh, analyst, as the, what, the chief international uh, um, analyst uh, for NBC News. Now, along the way, uh, Jim's written, uh, written uh, himself five books and co-authored four others. Among his previous works uh, is the, the Accidental Admiral, which came out a, a year after he retired from the military and looked back at some of his NATO challenges and offered insights on leadership and the future of global security. Uh, and his, um, his book in, um, that was published two, thirds ago, two years ago, Sea Power, uh, uh, which we also have copies of towards the front of the store, is a history of the seas written as a sort of tour of the world's uh, major bodies of water with, uh, with uh, up-to-date discussion of, uh, of their strategic importance. Uh, his latest work, uh, which he's here to talk about this evening, is Sailing True North. Uh, it's a bit like sea power in that it's also a journey across time, but instead of oceans and geography, Jim delves into individuals and biography. Uh, he singles out 10 admirals uh, who together span uh, more than 2,500 years of history from ancient Greece to the 21st century. Uh, his main aim in, in profiling them, he says, is to get at the most essential qualities of character. And motivating him, as he explains in the preface to the book, was a growing sense that these days we're witnessing the slow death of character as a result of a turning away, yeah, everybody starts <laughs> snickering at this point, as a result of turning away from the classic values of honesty, commitment, resilience, accountability, and moderation. And we, we can all think of examples there. <laughs> Um, anyway, I think we can we can all agree with that. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me with welcoming uh, James Tavridis. Thank, thank you, um, thank you, and absolutely incredibly kind introduction. And um, I've known Brad for many many years, uh, distinguished journalist, and uh, what a trade up to be running a bookstore. I think that's fabulous, Brad. Um, thank you for that very kind introduction. I will say people hear that and then they actually see me, you know, Supreme Allied Commander and all that, and they sort of have two reactions. One is, man, I thought you'd be taller than you appear to be. <laughs> and the other one is they say, you know, Stavridis, if you're really that cool, why were you not a Navy fighter pilot? Because <laughs> like, like my friend Carlos, I just drove ships. Um, and, you know, truth be told, I desperately wanted to be a Navy fighter pilot, but I had a traumatic experience when I was a young boy that made aviation really uh, difficult for me. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get underway. I think Brad has set up the book. The only thing I would add to what Brad said, what 
became the impetus to go after this book is that I think there is a fundamental misreading of the difference between leadership and character. Leadership is the influence we exert over others. It's an important function in all of our lives. Character is that how we lead ourselves. It's that inner voyage that in the end, I would argue, is more important. Think of it this way. Leadership is kind of a massive door that swings and influences many, many people. But that door swings on a very small hinge, the human heart, the character at the center of it. So as Brad said, I wanted to write a book less about leadership. We are awash in books on leadership, and we are underweight in books on character, hence sailing true north. So let's meet some admirals. I'm going to walk you through some of the characters in the book very swiftly. We're going to cover, as was said, about 2,500 years of history. Uh, And then I'm going to draw a couple of lessons and thoughts from them, and then we'll just open it up for a conversation. Let's go back 2,500 years ago to Themistocles of Athens. He is a charismatic leader. His greatest attribute is his ability from within himself to inspire others. And he needs all that inspiration because Athens is facing an existential threat. The Persian Empire is knocking at the door. They have already attempted to overrun Greece several times, and now they have brought a massive fleet off the coast of Athens, and they are prepared to once and for all destroy this pesky democracy. Themistocles is outnumbered one to five. One of his triremes, these massive road ships, for every one he has, the Persians have five. But he inspires his crews by gathering the captains and saying to them, tomorrow when we go into battle, you are all free men. Whereas the rowers on those Persian ships were all slaves. Themistocles says, tomorrow you must row for your family. Tomorrow you must row for your city. Tomorrow you must row for freedom. The next day, epic victory in the Bay of Salamis. The power of persuasion. And yet character. There's an arrogance about Themistocles. And in not too many years after this heroic, epic battle where he saves his polis, his city, Athens, he is ultimately rejected by the Athenians and ends up on the right side in the graphic working for Xerxes, the Persian emperor. So this is someone of enormous charisma who has an inner flaw of arrogance. Let's jump to an admiral on the other side of the world. This is a Chinese admiral who in 1405, his name is Zheng He, if you want to give it the Mandarin pronunciation. Generally, we anglicize it to Zheng He. I'll stay with that. And I want to make a point about his voyages. 1405, Zheng He is put in charge of massive fleets that are moving out for China. China builds huge ships. You see upper right here? You see that massive wooden sailing ship. It's 500 feet long, has a crew of 450. See that tiny little ship right next to it? That represents the flagship of Christopher Columbus, the Santa Maria. Columbus, in 1492, almost a century later, is sailing this tiny little vessel. Zheng He and his voyages really span the known world. Look at this graphic. These are the voyages of Zheng He in the early 1400s, long before Christopher Columbus finally gets that little ship and discovers America. And Those of you who are enmeshed in the geopolitics of the day will recognize these voyages, right? This is one belt, 
one road. This is the Chinese mercantile geoeconomic empire unfolding. Yet it really began almost 500 years ago under Zhang He. He was, as a young boy, captured, castrated, which was the style of the day, and as a eunuch, rose up through the ranks to become the greatest admiral in Chinese history. That's resilience. Starts life as a castrated slave, finishes voyaging the world, leading great fleets. It's a story of resilience. Let's jump back to Europe, and here we have one of our less admirable admirals. This is Sir Francis Drake. And Drake has many positive qualities, particularly decisiveness, physical courage, but he is also deeply flawed. He is someone who uses murder, torture, rape. He's a slaveholder. He is a, a very mixed bag for the Brits who award him a letter of mark. He's a privateer going through the Caribbean. And when I was U.S. Southern Command, everywhere I would go in the Caribbean, everywhere, I would be taken to the local historical museum and invariably there would be a diorama of Drake's raids into, you pick it, uh, Dominican Republic, uh, <laughs> Colombia, Cartagena, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Drake also was the second in command of the British fleet when it defeats the Spanish Armada. So I included Drake in this cast of admirals because of his decisiveness, his courage, his ability to move his men, and yet he's someone with a dark heart. He is both a patriot of England and he is a pirate. And in fact, the ride at Disneyland, Pirates of the Caribbean, is loosely based on Sir Francis Drake. Well, let me talk to you about an admiral I really admire. And this is Lord Nelson, Horatio Nelson. A couple of reasons I admire uh, Lord Nelson. Um, first and foremost, a great fighting admiral, won many battles, notably Trafalgar, where he defeats uh, Napoleon, combined French and Spanish fleet. By the way, that happened exactly 214 years ago today, October 21st. Today is Trafalgar Day, which any Brit in the room would know immediately. The other thing I like about my friend, Vice Admiral Nelson, is that he was about my size, about five feet, five inches tall on a really good day. And he also um, went through his life with a great deal of resilience as well. As you can see, kind of in the picture there, he lost one of his arms in battle. He lost an eye in battle, yet it did not deter him from the kind of physical courage that also inspired. He was also a notorious adulterer. On the left, the beautiful Emma Hamilton, with whom he had a, a long affair, had an illegitimate daughter, Horatia, named after him, Horatio. And uh, if you want to read a wonderful novel about their relationship, Susan Sontag's The Volcano Lover is a, a truly intimate portrait of the flaws of Nelson in this regard. You also see on the right there, he's holding up a telescope looking out in a battle, except that eye that he's looking through doesn't work. <laughs> this is where the expression to turn a blind eye to something actually comes from. Nelson lost one of his eyes and he was notorious for not necessarily doing exactly what his superior wanted. So they controlled everything by signal flags. He would occasionally just put the telescope to the blind eye and say to his flag captain, Hardy, I cannot see a signal. Go left, you know. Or, <laughs> Go to port, I guess. So Nelson, again, complicated, heroic. Many of you will have been to London, to Trafalgar Square, where his statue is the highest point of that wonderful square. He is deeply in the hearts of his countrymen in every sense, but also 
someone with flaws and human failings as well. So here's the most intellectual admiral in the history of the U.S. Navy. Uh, his name is Alfred Thayer Mahan. That's him on the left. Um, Dostoevsky said that an intellectual is someone with spectacles on their nose and winter in their hearts. This is kind of Alfred Thayer Mahan. He's not friendly. He's not outgoing. He is not decidedly not charismatic. Um, but he is a deep thinker. He constantly uses honest analysis to create new patterns of strategy for the United States Navy. And famously, he was lucky to make Admiral. He barely made it into this book because in one of his fitness reports as a commanding officer of a ship, the line was, Captain Mahan, colon, it is not the business of naval officers to write books. That almost <laughs> kept him out of the admiralty. But his, his genius, his stability, and also the fact that he was one of the founders of the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island, alongside Stephen B. Luce, um, helped propel him over the top finally to become an admiral. But of all the admirals in this book, the most cerebral, the most thoughtful, but also the least charismatic, the least connected with others. Well, let's talk about a British admiral from the turn of the last century. Um, this is one of two admirals that I would say, if I could snap my fingers and bring him back to life, I would want to go out and have a beer with Jackie Fisher. Um, he is brilliant, huge emotional intelligence, the ability to persuade people one-on-one. -on -one. He's extraordinarily charming personally, um, and he is also an enormous innovator. He comes into the British Navy in the 1860s. Think about that. Ships are sailing ships. Cannons are muzzle-loaded. Think of the U.S. Navy in the Civil War. That's when he becomes a midshipman. By the end of that century, the 19th century, he has dragged the British Navy into steel ships. He's made the shift not only from sail to coal, but from coal to liquid fuel. He is a proponent of submarines and torpedoes who began his career muzzle-loading cannons. It's an extraordinary progression, and it is an extraordinary example of innovation. That's really Jackie Fisher. And he also broke down tradition wherever he found it. And in fact, his younger mentee, although his boss was the young Sir Winston Churchill, and in one of their exchanges, Fisher was saying to Churchill, you know, these traditions of the Royal Navy, they're extraordinarily difficult. We have to overcome them. Churchill said famously, tradition, I'll give you the traditions of the Royal Navy, rum, buggery, and the lash. <laughs> Jackie Fisher broke all those down. Yet he also had his failings. He had an enormous ego. He could not step away from a position after he'd established it. He had great pride in his thinking, and it, at the Battle of Gallipoli, he knew it was going to fail, and yet he didn't want to walk away from his assessment. Churchill pushed him into that. It's an extraordinary story of a moment that Fisher, if he could, would take back. The best admiral, the best admiral on this list. And uh, this, of course, is Chester Nimitz, uh, the greatest of the American admirals in history, my view. This is Fleet Admiral Nimitz. I was a mere four-star admiral. Fleet Admiral Nimitz, five-star admiral, led our Navy through the Pacific War. And what I always think of when I think of Nimitz are three things. One, his calmness never raised his voice, didn't lose his temper, steady, steady, steady in the midst of enormous challenge. Number two, he managed and built teams remarkably. And anybody who has to deal with Bull Halsey and Douglas MacArthur as subordinates and can manage that team of rivals 
we ought to take off our hat to. And lastly, above all on Nimitz, it's, let me go back, it's resilience. You'll know these two battleships. One is the Arizona, before it was sunk at Pearl Harbor, losing thousands of sailors who are still entombed in it today. If you are ever privileged to go to Pearl Harbor, go and see the Arizona. Next to it, you see that other ship. That's Missouri, the battleship Missouri. These are the bookends of the Second World War. Arizona sunk at Pearl Harbor, Japanese surrender signed on Missouri. Here's the point. When Nimitz was given command of the fleet, it was literally smoking in the harbor. The ships were on the bottom, the, just the battleships. The carriers were out dodging the Japanese. So Chester Nimitz took command of the fleet, not on a big, beautiful battleship in his crisp choker whites. He took command of the U.S. Pacific Fleet in a set of rumpled khakis on the deck of a diesel submarine because that's what was available. And he squared his shoulders, he built his team, and slowly, surely, he won the war in the Pacific. Resilience, brilliant mind, self-control, Admiral Nimitz. Well, now I'm going to introduce you to a handful of admirals that I knew personally. Uh, I, I am old enough to have met Admiral Zumwalt, who was the great innovator of the modern Navy. He, takes, he becomes the chief of naval operations during the Vietnam War. He jumps over a huge number of more senior, more senior admirals to become the chief of naval operations, and immediately begins a whole series of innovations, everything from managing our Vietnamese inshore activities in that war to working on the frankly broken race relations of the U.S. Navy in this period. He is the first admiral to really listen to the deck plates to try and make fundamental social change in a Navy that badly needs it. I also knew Admiral Hyman Rickover, notoriously difficult admiral, someone with a real temper, but also someone who dragged the nuclear navy into existence. The reason we have nuclear submarines, the reasons we have nuclear aircraft carriers is right here, Hyman Rickover. Famously harsh on people, famously grinding people into detail. He said on the right, the devil is in the details and so is salvation. So a very difficult one to assess, particularly in today's world, when we think about toxicity and angry leaders and how we do not tolerate that. Yet Rickover achieved enormous results and created a real following in many of the officers who spent time around him. Frankly, I was just scared of him. But <laughs> what he contributed to the Navy cannot be denied, and he was a flag officer longer than any other admiral in the history of the United States. And let me close out my 10 with the second admiral I would most like to have a beer with. And many of you will not have heard of Grace Hopper, but she gets a PhD in mathematics from Yale in the 1940s. She's teaching, World War II hits, and Grace Hopper says, I want to join the Navy. I want to fight for my country except the problem is there are no women in the Navy at this point. She's one of the first women to put on a Navy uniform, and she is assigned and does brilliantly at computer programming, except she has to invent the whole idea because at this time, computers are really not programmed in the sense we understand it, and Amazing Grace, as she was called, came up with the idea of using human-like language to program computers. She is known as the mother of COBOL, the early computer programming language. That's her as a young woman. Today, that Navy destroyer, USS Hopper, is named for Amazing Grace, who pulled us into the computer age and also had a kind word for everybody, loved practical jokes, loved to read. Her apartment, when she died, had 10,000 books in it. Brad. 
Well, let me, that's 10 admirals, historical, who have all sailed on to the great fleet in the sky. I want to just mention two of my contemporaries that I have a lot of respect for. On the left is Admiral Michelle Howard. And these two couldn't be more different, by the way, in terms of their physiognomy. Uh, Michelle is African-American, about four foot 11, uh, surface warfare officer. If you saw the movie Captain Phillips about the rescue of that ship, she was the one-star admiral who ran that mission. And she has broken every barrier you can imagine at every stage of her career. I really respect her, her determination. On the right is Admiral Bill McRaven, pretty well known at the moment, but let me tell you why I put Bill McRaven here. It has nothing to do with his politics and nothing to do with his operational record. You may not know that Bill McRaven has been fighting leukemia for seven years, and he's been very public about it. Um, it's life-threatening, but he continues to uh, stand and be counted every single day. And uh, I'll never forget being with him in the White House. who were a couple of four-star admirals. And I was asking him about, you know, his thoughts about, are you going to stay on active duty or get out? And he said, told me about this leukemia thing. And, and I said, wow, that's, I can't imagine that kind of challenge in my life, given all that you're doing now. And he said, yeah, it's, it's just another mission. And uh, that's Bill McRaven. So two admirals, I put them here for resilience and also just to bring it into the current day. So right about now, you ought to say, okay, Admiral, great. I uh, met some admirals. I knew a couple of them, but now I know some more admirals. But what do you think? What do you take away from these admirals? What are the qualities? So in a couple of minutes, I'll sketch out some qualities, and then we're going to just open it up to anything everyone wants to talk about. I'm going to start with the number one inner quality that I think matters the most of character, which then enables you to be a great leader. And I think it's this. It's listening. This, by the way, is not Photoshop. This is a man who appears to have really big hearing aids. This is actually an air defense system from the 1930s. He's listening for incoming aircraft. It's quite innovative for the day. When I was a NATO commander, I kept thinking I'd see another one of these in Belgium somewhere. <laughs> I put it here as metaphor for the fact that the number one attribute of character is empathy. It is the ability to listen to the other. And it's kind of easy to listen to your boss. Most of us have learned to listen to our junior folks in our organization. It's hard sometimes to listen to your peers, but they can tell you more and share more with you honestly than anybody else. And the hardest thing is to listen to your opponents. That is the greatest single failure in modern American life, is our polarization and our inability, seemingly at the moment, to cross that divide. Character matters. This is the top. And when I look at all the admirals we've mentioned, the one I would put here is Nimitz, who had that high emotional intelligence, that ability to listen, that quiet confidence. Reading. What does character tell us about reading? I think that those who, and we are, of course, in one of the iconic bookstores in America, surrounded by books, and I would argue that part of building character is what you read. You are what you read in so many ways. And that can be nonfiction or how about a few good novels. And by the way, if you haven't read The Testament or picked up a copy, it's at the front of the store by Margaret Atwood, she crushes it. Read, read, read. And when I think about books, I think about Grace Hopper and that curiosity, and that's the quality that reading satisfies. Because only through reading can you have so many different lives. When you pick up a book, you walk back in time, or you walk into someone else's life. It's a remarkable gift that you hold in your hand. Grace Hopper, 10,000 books, but why? Because of curiosity. That's the character quality that shines through. How about our values? Our values. 
democracy, liberty, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, gender equality, racial equality. Look, we execute them imperfectly, but they are the right values. And when I think about value-driven admirals, I think about Zumwalt, who wanted desperately to put more just values in our Navy. And I'll illustrate it by pointing something out about this photograph. This was a gift to me when I was the executive assistant to the Secretary of the Navy. And someone gave it to me and said, Admiral, look at this beautiful picture of a destroyer crew, 1949. And I started looking at it very closely, and I encourage you to do so as well. The front row, the officers, is quite complete. And behind them, two rows back, are all the sailors. Look at that second row where the chief petty officers are. What's wrong with it? Three are missing. I started looking very carefully, trying to figure out what happened. And I finally found the three missing chief petty officers. There are three African Americans. They're standing all the way at the back of the formation. That's my Navy in 1949. I put it here because character is that inner voice that tells you, look hard at things, because something that looks terrific can have some flaws. And secondly, it's that inner voice that says, ask yourself every day, what am I doing now that in 50 years is going to look oh so wrong? Character, Zumwalt, just qualities. Teamwork, Nelson built great teams. Nimitz built great teams. This is a pirate takedown off the Somali coast. But here's the trick. Those are French special forces. They've land, they were landed by an Italian helicopter, refueled from a Danish frigate, operating on intelligence provided by an American maritime patrol aircraft with tipper information coming from a satellite network operated by the European Union. Building teams. Some of our admirals were very good at that. And as I wrap up here, good admirals are also communicators. And you're looking at that picture and you're thinking, okay, retired Admiral Stavridis, these might be shipping lanes, no. These might be airline routes, no. These might be fiber optic cables, no. This is Facebook. The world according to Facebook, the brighter the white, the higher the concentration of Facebook users. The tell, if you're a poker player, is that China is dark because their social networks are, shall we say, supervised. This is communication at scale. Admirals are, who are successful, people of character, communicate ideas at scale and they communicate them one-on-one. -on -one. This is a photograph of me as Supreme Allied Commander with my opposite number, the Supreme Commander of the Russian Armed Forces, General Nikolai Makarov. I always liked General Makarov. As you can see, he's a man of normal height. <laughs> We're actually having a, a moment here about submarines in the Arctic. It's an important meeting. When it was done, my boss called me, Secretary Gates, Bob Gates, best boss ever, called me and said, Stavridis, how did the meeting go with Makarov? I said, sir, it was outstanding. We saw everything eye to eye. <laughs> the point is, you got to move your ideas, communicate. That's a character-driven exercise, both at scale, and you got to know that it matters personally. Last quality I want to leave you with, and it's a simple one. It's honesty. It's truthfulness. This is the battleship Maine, USS Maine. She was sunk on February 15, 1898 in Havana Harbor. You may remember the story. The main blows up. We, the United States, immediately announced that this is a result of terrorists, Spanish terrorists, and we go to war. Remember the main is what starts the Spanish-American War. Except 50 years later, the U.S. Navy went down and salvaged this thing, and we found out it sank as a result of an internal explosion. We did not follow the truth initially. And I'll tell you this, everywhere I've been, every office I've been in, I had a picture of the main, and there's one in my office today. 
And I keep that picture there for two reasons. One is to remind myself not to rush into judgment. And secondly, remember that your ship can blow up underneath you at any moment. Have a plan B. Well, that's our story. And uh, I have a small suggestion for you if you want to internalize character. And it's as follows. Ask yourself tonight or some quiet evening, get out a piece of paper and write down the names of some people you admire. Who are your heroes? Very few people ask themselves that question. Who do you really admire? Someone in your family, someone in history, a current figure. Who do you really admire? Write down five or six names of people you really admire. These are some folks I really admire. Next to their names, write down why. Why do you admire them? I admire Juan Manuel Santos, the president of Colombia, Nobel Prize winner, for the political courage he showed to pull Colombia out of a war. I admire Condi Rice for breaking every barrier anybody ever put in front of her. I admire George Marshall, upper right, for, like Nimitz, his quiet self-confidence. Middle bottom is my dad. I admire him because he was a great father. Write down why you admire. And here's the hard part. It's the third column. Ask yourself, how am I doing? Am I as good a father as my dad? I'm not. I work at it hard. Am I as courageous as Juan Manuel Santos? Am I as determined as Condi Rice? Am I as quietly self-confident as George Marshall? I got work to do. Maybe all of us do. That exercise is a pretty good one. All this can be hard. I'm Greek-American. I'm allowed to put Sisyphus up here. Character is that boulder that will roll down. Sometimes the seas are going to be rough. Some days the seas will be very calm. The trick is maintaining your character no matter what the sea around you is doing. Last image, and I love this image. This was a very uh, well-known photograph four or five years ago. These are Somali migrants. They're standing on a beach, and prosaically, they're holding up their cell phones, trying to get a better signal, right? We've all done that. Newsflash, doesn't work. Prosaically, that's what's happening. What's happening metaphorically in this picture? They're reaching for the light. They want to connect. They want to be part of this world moving on. So I'm going to close because this is a photograph of hope, the greatest inner character of all is that ability to be optimistic, to hope. I'm going to close with a quote by Napoleon, because short people have to stick together at all times. <laughs> Napoleon said, a leader is a dealer in hope. A leader is a dealer in hope. That is the kind of leader you want to be. You can be that leader on this inner voyage of character. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. A couple of microphones here. Yeah. We've got a, a young man here who's going to ask a question. Maybe mom can help get the mic down. Okay. Um, uh, come on. You're good. Is this working? Yes. No, just ask the question. Um, uh, well, how is the Navy these days? Okay, the question is, how's the Navy these days? And the answer is, this is a very good question. So two years ago, you may remember, the Navy had two terrible collisions. We had two of our beautiful Arleigh Burke destroyers collide with civilian ships in the Pacific, our vaunted 7th Fleet. We lost 17 sailors in those two collisions, died because of these collisions. The Navy has been re-examining itself, particularly the surface line portion that I am from. We have exercised, I think, a great deal of character, starting with accountability. We fired the four-star admiral. We fired the three-star. We fired the two-star. We fired the one-star. We fired the commodore. We fired both ship captains, both ship executive officers, both ships senior enlisted. We cleared out a lot of problems, 
had real accountability, and we've been rebuilding. The Navy is much stronger than it was two years ago, and that's a story of organizational resilience. Good to see you, sir. How's it going? Question? And then, and then we'll go over here. I uh, had the pleasure of listening to your uh, podcast uh, earlier. And, uh, Thank you. I want to talk about the role of character in building teams. And wonder if you could uh, tell what happened on the USS Barry and the Suez Canal. <laughs> Painfully. And you had a team help you out. I can. Um, when I was uh, in my mid-30s, I had my first command. It was an Arleigh Burke destroyer, much like the ones I've mentioned here. Uh, 500 feet long, crew of 350 I was very proud of that ship. Uh, we were forward deployed. I was kind of exhausted. We were about to go through the Suez Canal. We had an Egyptian pilot who was supposed to guide us through the canal. As you come north to south in the Suez Canal, you have to stop halfway and you park your ship in a thing called the Great Bitter Lake. And you, so we pulled over and our pilot was telling us, Go there, go there, Captain, go there. And my navigator, and I was tired, exhausted, just like whatever the pilot says, just drive it over there. My navigator was uh, 26 years old. His name was Rob Chadwick. Uh, he and his team were navigating, and they said, Captain, don't go there. The ship's going to run aground. The pilot said, I'm the Egyptian pilot. I know exactly these waters. I do this every single day. Tell your whippersnapper lieutenant to sit down and shut up. I'll tell you where to drive the ship. I got to say, I was a little punchy, but I thought, okay, look, the pilot, local knowledge, my green lieutenant over here, I said, just keep going. Lieutenant Rob Chadwick, those of you in the Navy will understand this. He's a lieutenant. He says, this is the navigator. I have the con. All engines back one third. I mean, it's an act of mutiny. It's an act of uh, complete insubordination. Um, the pilot blew up. We did back down the ship. To sort of sort it out, I said, drop the anchor, because you're always ready in these situations. Drop the anchor. So we're backing down. We're dropping the anchor. And we then put a boat in the water, went and measured the water, and we would have gone aground if we'd continued on. So Rob Chadwick, Lieutenant Rob Chadwick, saved my career. <laughs> to, to complete the story... Some years later, I'm a one star, and Rob Chadwick is now a commander in the Pentagon, September 11th, 2001. And I've been mentoring him, and I called him that morning. He was down in the Navy Intelligence Center, and I called him and said, hey, Rob, why don't you come up for a cup of coffee this morning? He came up to my office, airplane hit, just 150 feet away from the two of us. Everybody else in that center was killed, including a number of very close friends. So Rob and I have a very warm set of relationships. He saved my career, but I saved his life. And by the way, Commander Rob Chadwick is now Rear Admiral Rob Chadwick, one star, out in command of our fleet in Hawaii. Yes, sir. Hey, this just popped in my mind, so I apologize if it's not a good example, but I'm just kind of curious. What I thought of is, and I don't know that much about it, but Admiral Canaris and the German... Sure. And to what extent, as most people probably don't know, he was the head of German intelligence. Mm -hmm. Of the and, Abwehr. Pardon? Of the Abwehr. German yeah, right, right. And, but then worked, I don't know to what extent, against the Nazi regime. Mm -hmm. But so he was basically, I don't know, betraying his oath of office, I suppose. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know. So anyway, have you any thoughts sure. on where he fits in? Well, this is a, a wonderful question, and I'm going to expand it slightly as in, why these 10? Why not Admiral Canaris? Uh, why not Admiral Arleigh Burke? Why not Admiral James Stockdale? Um, these 10 were selected to kind of illustrate a whole series of qualities that I've talked about. In terms of Admiral Canaris specifically, um, he, as did several German uh, very senior officers, um, actively work against the Nazi regime when they really realized a, the totality of what was occurring, and B, that Germany was going to lose the war. So that's a, a whole long, separate conversation. But um, I think anytime you face one of those tough choices, and I think this really is your point, you have to really look inside at your character. I think Canaris did that. He paid a high price for it. Yes, sir. 
thank you very much for your presentation, Admiral. Um, I'm Gordon Grant. I'm an uh, economist and former Wall Streeter. I just spent three years living in the Islamic Republic of Iran for a little context. And that's an area you know very well. Thank you for your Bloomberg pieces about that. Sure. I wanted to touch upon your points about Themistocles um, and what happened with the Persians and, and ask your insights about what's going on today with the legacy of the Persians, which is Iran. <laughs> yeah, nice point. You've said very well um, that this admiral was an exemplar of conviction and flexibility and defeated the Persians who had a much superior force by forcing them into the straits Correct. where their um, Through you know, a deception. smaller fleets mm -hmm. could defeat Correct. the larger uh, the larger Persians. And you also made a point about empathy mm -hmm. and connecting with people even like Admiral Makarov, mm -hmm. who could be said to be a leader of an enemy state. Mm -hmm. Today, is America failing to contain Iran because it is lacking flexibility mm -hmm. or conviction mm -hmm. or empathy? And, and are its leaders lacking in these charismatic traits, mm -hmm. like General Soleimani might be said to have, or Rear Admiral Fadevi? What is mm -hmm. your impression mm -hmm. from having squared off against the Iranians and having been in the Gulf? Sure. First of all, um, when I speak about Iran, I often show a map of the Middle East from roughly uh, Pakistan to the shores of the Mediterranean. And I show a massive green area. And I, I'll show it to an audience, and I'll say, what do you think this is? And they'll say, oh, well, this is, if it's a geopolitically oriented audience, I'll say, well, that's kind of where the Iranians are pushing. Nope, that's a map of the Persian Empire 2,500 years ago, <laughs> when the Persians, today's Iranians, controlled probably 40% of the world's population. Um, so first and foremost, we misunderstand Iran in the most fundamental context, which is to say, we think of them as a kind of annoying mid-sized power in the Middle East. They don't see themselves that way. You know that. You live there. They see themselves as inheritors of an imperial tradition and also the carriers of Shia uh, Islam. So we need to understand that. And this is a good example of in any situation, as I said earlier, the hardest voice to listen to is the other, is your opponent. So... That's a slightly long way of saying we misread the Iranians. We don't spend enough time understanding their history. We don't spend enough time listening to them. Having said that, um, Iranian behavior today, my view, must be confronted. And I think, it's, I think a good philosophy here with Iran is confront where you must, but cooperate where you can. And I think that is... Uh, a, a very applicable strategy, and I'll close with the thought that what we have yet to see, uh, frankly, out of either the Obama administration or the Trump administration, is a coherent long-term strategy. It's, it, our approach is too tactical. There is a tactical need, but we need to step back, understand the history, look at the challenges, and build a more coherent strategic approach. Thanks. Great. Yes, sir. Back to China. Sure. Are, are we up to the challenge? I love a good short question. Um, <laughs> so another book that I, I recommend is by a friend of mine, a Harvard professor named Graham Allison. It's called Destined for War. Hi, Jerry. <laughs> and it is a book about the Thucydides trap, this idea that in human history, when an established power is challenged by a rising power, war often ensues. Graham looks at 18 cases of this. In 12 of them, a world war ensues. This happened last, about 100 years ago. Established state, United Kingdom, rising power, Kaiser's Germany. We all know how that turned out. So with that as backdrop, um, I think we are up to the challenge, and it relates to the conversation I just had with the gentleman about Iran. We need a strategic approach. So here, here would be my strategy for dealing with China. I would say we need a strong and capable military, particularly a maritime one, to challenge China and their claims in the South China Sea. We need an economic strategy that recognizes we're going to have to bend that relationship a little bit. Uh, we're going to have to deal with these trade imbalances. We're going to have to deal with intellectual property theft but we want to bend it without breaking it because there are two economic nuclear weapons here. One is we could shut our markets to China. That would uh, be the effect of a nuclear detonation in their economy. 
They have an enormous amount of American debt they hold. That could be quite problematic for us as well. We don't want to get to that point. So we need an economic negotiation. Here I think the Trump administration is doing a reasonable job of trying to bend that relationship without breaking it. And then lastly, we need a political strategy that particularly thinks about how we deal with Taiwan, how we deal with every uh, engagement we face, particularly what we see in Hong Kong, what we see of Chinese activity, the one belt, one road. How do we counter that politically as well as economically? So we need to build a strategy for dealing with China. Can we do that? I think so. The battlefields will be maritime, South China Sea, cyber and artificial intelligence, and culturally along this one belt, one road. This is one of the great stories of the 21st century. I'm cautiously optimistic we're up to the challenge. Captain Jerry Hendricks. Good evening, Admiral Staff. Um, so I was tempted to do the one question in 26 parts, but <laughs> I'm going to boil it down because uh, four of the officers that you highlight tonight, uh, and this goes to character building sure. and our acceptance of mistakes, but at least four uh, had, uh, shall we say, some collisions with fate earlier in their career. <laughs> yeah. Admirals Nimitz, Mahan, even Admiral Zumwalt took yep. out a pier. Yep. Um, and there was a reason that Rick over become an engineering duty officer as opposed to a line officer. So right. how, how do you address sort of the acceptance of failure as a character building practice? I mean, yeah. Nimitz should have been done after he uh, grounded his destroyer. He grounded that destroyer as a 20 something year old. Um, and I'll answer the question because you posed it so succinctly. I'm going to answer it succinctly with a quote from General Salak Shalakashvili, former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, who is himself a remarkable figure in so many different ways, a deep individual of character, born in Europe, spoke Polish, his native, his mother tongue, Russian, uh, extraordinary figure. Um, I asked General Shali. Uh, that same question. I was working on a speech for General Shalley. I was a, a young commander. And, and I asked him, when can you forgive a mistake? And he said, and I'm going to use military rank here, but I think you'll all get this. He said, we can forgive a captain a captain's mistake. We can forgive a general a general's mistake. But we cannot forgive a general a captain's mistake, yeah. right? I think that's pretty accurate. And, and the short answer to that is, uh, yes, we can forgive. And I'll give you one practical example from my career. Uh, when I was the captain of the aforementioned Barry, uh, which almost ran aground, but my navigator sailed, <coughs> saved me. Uh, later on in that tour, we, we had a string of everything going great. And we were the top ship on the waterfront. We actually won this award, the Battenberg Cup, as the top ship in the Atlantic fleet. And young uh, Captain Stavridis started to feel like, okay, yeah, I got this. You know, things are going great. And we went out for a big engineering inspection. And we got out. This was coming out of uh, our home port. And we got out of Norfolk. We were just out there in the Bay Capes, as we call them, the waters off the Virginia coast. And the whole ship ground to a halt. I won't drag you through all the problems. To say the least, we failed the engineering inspection. Here's the really bad part. We were so broken down, they towed us back into port. Yeah. And they towed us right by all the other ships, <laughs> obviously. And so I was like crouching down in my bridge chair trying to be invisible. And I literally went home that night and I said to my wife, Laura, it's all over. Tomorrow, the Commodore is going to come down. He's going to fire me. And then I'm going to, you know, I'm going to become a teacher or an academic or we're going to figure something else out. So we had a big cry about it. And then uh, the next morning I went down there prepared to get fired. And, and really three things happened, Mike, and this to your question. The Commodore came down and he said, you know, Stavridis, bad, really bad day. But, you know, you've got a pretty good record. I see some potential in you. We're going to give you another chance at the inspection. We're going to give you six weeks to fix everything. If you can get it done and get through the inspection in six weeks, we'll, we'll work this out. So my boss forgave. 
Secondly, my crew, and I thought I was going to spend the day walking around pumping them up. My crew kept coming up to me and saying, it's okay, Captain. We got this. And they dove into it and fixed, I won't go into it all, but in my crew. But the third thing that happened was those other captains on the waterfront who had watched us get towed in after watching us win all these awards, many of them called me up and said, Jim, really bad. <laughs> what can we do to help? Do you, need, do you need some of our sailors to come and help? Do you need parts? What do you need? And I, I mention all that in the context of your question, the capacity for forgiveness when you, when you see potential. And secondly, your peers. I think I mentioned that earlier. Your peers are often the ones who will be the most honest with you. And so what was a very dark moment in my career, actually, I learned a lot from it. And that's part of the voyage of character. It's been a pleasure being with all of you. And I have, if, wait, 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 wait. I have, one last, I have one last thought. Because one thing all of these admirals had in common was service. They wanted to serve their countries. And these days, a lot of people come up to me and say, you know, Admiral, thank you for your service. And I appreciate that deeply when people say that. Here's my point. There are so many ways to serve this country. Certainly our military folks. But how about our CIA officers? How about our diplomats? How about our firemen? How about our police officers? How about our Peace Corps volunteers? How about Teach for America? How about Volunteer for America? How about school teachers in rural South Carolina teach in packed classrooms for $37,000 a year? You think they're serving the country? I do. How about nurses at inner city clinics working essentially minimum wage? There are so many ways to serve this country. So as I close tonight, many of you have said to me, thank you for your service. To all of you who are serving the country in some way, I say thank you for your service. And please encourage others to serve in whatever way they choose because service is the least partisan thing we can do. It may be our salvation going forward if we can find ways to serve together. Thank you for your service. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you.